Well, our, our mission at, at the college is, is to prepare leaders for Christian life and ministry. And that's a mission, I think, when we look at, at the New Testament that Jesus uh, also came and, and demonstrated. Uh, our text this morning is Luke chapter 10. So if you have an old-fashioned paper Bible, an iPad, an iPod, even a Blackberry, you can still get the Bible on the Blackberry, um, or any other number of devices. If you want to turn there, and uh, we'll look at Luke chapter 10. Now, we're going to look at 10, 1 through 20, but I have a deal for you this morning. I know you're probably already starting to think about lunch. Uh, so instead of doing all 20 verses, we're going to just look at the first three, 10, 1 to 3, and then we'll skip all the stuff in the middle and do 17 to 20. So how's that for, how's that for a deal? All right, so uh, chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 3, and uh, it's up on the screen too. Uh, after this, the Lord appointed 70 or 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Now we'll skip down to verse 17. The 70, or the 72, depending on your version, uh, returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, my main training in, in life and has been to, uh, to study the New Testament and Christian origins. And it's important uh, when we read Scripture always to read it in context. The context often tells us a lot, and that's nonetheless true here in Luke chapter 10. Some interesting features about Jesus sending out the 70 or 72, I'll come to explain that in a minute, um, here. Um, this is the only gospel, this is the only place where we find this passage. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about Jesus sending out the 12, if you go back a chapter to Luke chapter 9, Jesus has sent out the 12, but only Luke talks about sending out the 70 or the 72, and that's significant in Luke's telling of the story. Um, Luke, was Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and the same author wrote the book of Acts, and even though we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then we have John in there, and then we come along and, and have Acts, Luke and Acts really ought to be read together as one story. Um, if we turn to looking at, uh, looking at Luke, there's a journey that takes place that begins at the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke and it concludes at the end of Acts. And what Luke does is he focuses very much on the geography. So all our familiar Christmas stories, you know, with the angel coming to visit Mary and Zechariah and Elizabeth, all that stuff, that starts out at the beginning of Luke. And it's all centered around Jerusalem. And after Jerusalem, uh, we have Jesus. The last scene there is Jesus teaching in the temple as a boy. And then the next scene, we have Jesus going out from Jerusalem. And he does his, his ministry in Galilee. And he does that up until Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. And chapter 9 and verse 51 a major change happens in Luke. And at that point, Jesus sets his face resolutely for Jerusalem. At 9.51, Jesus shifts again and the focus becomes Jerusalem. And from 9.51 until Jesus arrives at Jerusalem, Luke repeats a number of times uh, as they were going to Jerusalem. Uh, he couldn't be deterred because he was going to Jerusalem. He was heading to Jerusalem. They were going to Jerusalem. He says it a number of times. Jerusalem becomes the destination. And then, of course, he arrives in Jerusalem, and, and in Jerusalem is where Jesus is crucified, buried, and raised again to new life. And then the book of Acts picks up in Jerusalem. 
And there, the resurrected Jesus instructs his disciples and he, he tells them to go out from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And yes, the book of Acts goes out from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And the book of Acts concludes with the apostle Paul sitting in a Roman prison. And Rome, at the time, was the empire of the world. It was the gateway to anywhere else. And so Luke has taken us from Jerusalem to Judea to the ends of the earth through Samaria too. We don't forget Samaria. Um, so it's interesting here where Jesus sends out the 70 and 72 uh, or 72 where this takes place. Now a quick aside, is it 70 or 72? And the answer for that uh, is you should really come and take my New Testament class in the fall because it's exciting stuff. It's because the Bible you hold in your hand, and much less the one you hold on your phone, uh, did not download from heaven in its completed form Jesus' words all nicely colored in red. That's not how they showed up, much less in, in English or even King James English. Uh, that's just not how it showed up. Uh, it showed up through manuscripts and manuscripts and some guy copied a manuscript and another one manuscript and another manuscript and another one and we could go on for a long time because there's thousands of them. It's fascinating, it's exciting work and dreary old curmudgeonly professors are out there looking at these manuscripts and that's what I'd like to be. But um, anyways, so lots of the manuscripts say 70 and about an equally uh, proportionate amount say 72 and it's really hard to know. So that's why some versions went with 70 some went with 72. Who's right? The Lord will sort it out, and I'm sure none of us will lose our salvation if we opt for one or the other. Um, nonetheless, it's exciting stuff. Isn't it exciting? Just saying manuscripts. Isn't that exciting? Oh, my hearts are going. Anyway, getting off the manuscripts now, uh, getting back to Luke and some more relevant stuff. Uh, Luke, when he sends out the 70 or 72, he does this uh, at a point in the journey where Jesus has just set his face for Jerusalem. And in this section of Luke's gospel where Jesus is going to face his death, his obedience to God and facing his death, and he will be vindicated and raised up, in this section we learn about Jesus and what it means to be a Messiah, one who's going to suffer and die. But we also learn what it means to be a disciple. And in this section of Luke, he really unpacks what it means to follow Jesus. And so in 951, after he sets his face for Jerusalem, uh, we have some examples of discipleship where someone wants to come and follow Jesus. And he says, oh, but my, my father's died. Uh, I'm just going to go bury him first. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. You come follow me. That sounds a bit harsh. But it sets the tone for what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus means you are absolutely devoted to Jesus. And that's what marks the whole section in this, in this passage, what it means to be a disciple. And it's interesting, when we go to chapter 9 and verse 51, where Jesus sets his face for Jerusalem, the very first thing that Jesus does with his disciples is he sends them out ahead of him into enemy territory. He sends them out ahead of him and he sends them to the Samaritans. And the Samaritans don't like the Jews. And the Jews do not like the Samaritans. And Jesus sends out his trusted little lambs out to this group and predictably they reject the message. And, and as a consequence, um, they want to call down fire. We'll take a look here. Chapter 9, verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was headed to Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And then he and his disciples went on to another village. So he sends them out unaccompanied to, to this hostile territory. And, and Jesus has plans for, Jerusalem, for, for Samaria, incidentally. But we don't find that out to the book of Acts. That's why we want to read those together. Um, 
So they move on. Um, when we turn to our passage now, a few verses later here, chapter 10 uh, and verse 1, we see, we want to pick out some of the patterns of discipleship here. So let's take a look at chapter 10 and verse 1. After the Lord appointed the 70 or 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every place where he was about to go. So the first thing we want to note out of this about what Jesus does is that, is that Jesus sends. Importantly though, in Luke's gospel, he's already sent out the 12 and he sent out other people ahead of him. Jesus sends others. And why this is important for us to understand in discipleship is that when Jesus sends, he's not sending out an elite group. It isn't the SEAL team of Christians who get sent. It's not the disciples or the apostles. Jesus sends everyone. When Jesus sends, he sends those who are his followers. No one is excluded. So discipleship means, on one hand, being sent by Jesus. And that's not something that's reserved for pastors and missionaries and professional Christian workers. That is something that applies to every single person who considers themselves a follower of Jesus. So Jesus, Jesus sends, is the first thing we want to see, and he sends everyone. Is everyone ready to be sent? We're not at the end of the message yet. You can, you can reserve that till later. Um, the next thing that we want to notice out of this passage here, uh, if we, as we go on, is that... Um, in verse 2, Jesus says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. The next thing Jesus does here is he gives some instructions to his disciples. He's going to send them out, and he instructs them. And there's two observations here I want to make from this, from this verse. I'm going to show you a picture, and you can win some Horizon Gear prizes here. All right, so let's so we'll take a look at this picture. Now, question number one, who can identify this bridge? It is the Albert Street Bridge of Regina. Here you go. I'm going to give you some Horizon Gear for getting the correct answer. Let's give this man a hand. <laughs> All right, question number two. Why is the Albert Street Bridge in Regina mentioned in the Guinness Book of World Records? I hear it. The shortest bridge. What's that? Over. Yes, the shortest bridge over the longest body of water. This one, Albert. I don't know who's winning this prize. I have more in the back. You can all three come claim something. I'm, I'll go to this one first. Was that you? Did you say that? Sure, take your prize. I know you, anyone, you two can come and get some later at the back. It is the shortest bridge over the longest body of water. So think about this. As you're driving, longest, yeah, reverse that. Thank you. Strike that. Reverse it. Okay. It is the longest, yeah, the shortest bridge over the longest body of water would just get you wet. Um, <laughs> it is the longest bridge over the shortest body of water. Good catch. Um, I need to take my prize back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It is the longest bridge over the shortest body of water. Which is to say, next time you're in Regina, and you're driving over the Albert Street Bridge, you'll notice that you're still driving over the bridge, and you can wave at the guy who's having a barbecue in his backyard. Because the bridge is still going, and there's the guy's house, and his kids are playing, and you keep going. Now, why would you invest all of this money in building this great bridge? And if you get really close on the bridge, you'll see that the pillars... Uh, are hand painted. 
seems like an awfully big expense, a waste of money. And you know, we can comment on how our tax dollars are spent and maybe, you know, whatever, but it seems like a silly thing to do, except when we realize when it was built. This, built was, this bridge was built during the Great Depression in the 1930s, when nobody could get any work. And so the construction of this bridge was a way to employ people and give them some personal self-worth and significance during a time when people couldn't work. This bridge stands as a make-work project. But when we turn to Jesus and what he says, we want to notice that Jesus is not assigning a make-work project. Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. The harvest, though, is plentiful. There is legitimate work to do. There is a lot of work to do. What Jesus is asking is not a make-work project. And there's a second thing we need to note from this, though. When Jesus is calling people into the harvest field, we note that it is his harvest field. This is an important point for us in our very independent, very self-sufficient Western mindset to get. Because in the first century, you didn't work your own, you didn't work your own field. You were unlikely to have had the financial resources to own a decent sized field. If it was yours, you worked it because that was what you were going to eat because you barely had enough to sustain your family. But you were probably working somebody else's field. So you didn't have the option to say, eh, you know, I don't feel like working it today. I think I'll, I think I'll take the day off. Uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't your prerogative. Now for us, we own our houses. We own our cars, you know. My car needs some work on the radiator, but eh, you know, I can let it I can let it run down. That's my right. That's my property. You can't tell me that I have to t take care of my car. It's my stuff. I can disregard my clothes. I can disregard my toys. I can treat them as poorly as I want because they're mine, and that's my right. The people to whom Jesus was speaking didn't have those rights. There was no option. It's not, if you should feel like it, perhaps today you might join me in the field for a a couple of hours of labor. For Jesus, the work was expected. It was assumed. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. If it's our harvest field, we can neglect it. But it isn't our harvest field. The harvest field is the Lord's. And it's his assumption that his disciples, the ones he's sending out, which is to say, not the elite, but everyone is go are going to work it. And there's so much work to be done that he's also expecting, we're going to be praying there'll be other laborers to join us because there's that much work to do. All right, so Jesus sends everyone and Jesus expects everyone to be, to be working is his instruction. The third, the third thing that we want to look at here. Uh, is in verse 3. And in this one, we see that Jesus also warns. And this is a warning that we need to take when we consider Christian work. Go, says Jesus, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. The third thing that we need to note here is that the, the field into which Jesus is sending his workers is occupied by an enemy. It's his field but an enemy has control of it. And so he's sending his workers out into an enemy field. And, and following Jesus then is something of a risky occupation. And this is something that I get in where I work, when I work at a Bible college. I'm well aware of, of the risks um, that, that come about. It's a risky occupation, and it's also a rewarding occupation. Now we see the, the reward, um, if we go down to verse 17, right near the end, we can see the reward um, where we see the 70 or 72 return with joy and say, look, even the demons submit to us in your name. There's reward 
in what Jesus is doing and sending out his followers. Reward in working at a college of higher education, training Christian leaders. Every year we get young adults who come in, and they come in to the college with a faith that's really sort of their parents, or their youth pastors, or their churches. And at some point in their journey, where they're confronted with some tough stuff, where what we had time to talk about in Sunday school doesn't cut it anymore, and at some point they release that faith. And there's like this loss of gravity in the room, and they kind of float. And you're not quite sure where they're going to land. And then gravity kicks back in, and they're back on their feet again. And this time, though, they're, they now have their own faith. And they're now standing in their own faith, firmer, standing next to the faith of their parents or of their, their pastors in their tradition. We also get to see people come in who've come in for unsure of what it is that they're going to do in their lives, and yet during their time they hear something from God, and they are suddenly sent in a new direction, a direction that they, aren't, they had never previously considered. There's a lot of reward in that, and that's the sort of reward we could probably see Jesus uh, relishing. But there's also some risk. Jesus says, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. He says in verse 19, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. These are not the cuddly creatures that we want in our homes. To overcome the power of the enemy. The risk is not acknowledging that there's an enemy. The risk is a naivety that says, well, if you're going to follow the Lord, it's, it's going to be all good. It's going to be all easy. C.S. Lewis uh, made the point that there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. The risk is not acknowledging that the harvest field is occupied by an enemy. And working especially with young adults become very well acquainted with that risk that our world is increasingly it seems beholden to an enemy. Uh, in a 2006 Christianity Today published uh, a, a study that had been running by Steve Henderson. He has a research firm. And in 2006, talking about American teens, Henderson reported that 52% of incoming freshmen going into, into public university uh, who identify themselves as born again upon entering a public university will either no longer identify themselves as born again four years later on or, if they do still claim that identification, will not have attended any religious service in over a year. So that's a 50% loss. Those who came in as Christians, half of them left no longer identifying as Christians. Now we can say, well, that's the states. That's old data. That's 2006. That's really old. Uh, so this year, the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada uh, published its findings that it, from its study it noted that for every five Catholic and mainline Protestant kids who attended church at least weekly in the 80s and 90s, only one still attends at least weekly now as an adult. And for those raised in evangelical traditions like ours, it is one in two, again 50%. And that's not all. Most who have quit attending altogether have also dropped their Christian affiliation. It's a 50% attrition rate, so I don't know where you invest. But if that was your return, you'd probably be firing the whoever it was that was handling your resources. But wait, it gets worse. Because it's not just that there's an enemy lurking outside the church, out there, let's all huddle up. He's evidently active within the church as well. Uh, over the past, since 2001 and continuing on, there's been a a Lilly Foundation study being done in the U.S. on the faith of teenagers. 
uh, headed by Christian Smith, who's a, who's a sociologist at Notre Dame University. And, and Smith has been surveying the, the faith convictions of young adults and teens in the U.S. And these are people who would profess to some sort of religious affiliation. And what they found is that within the church, not those out there, but within the church, the type of faith that's being professed is so alien to Christianity, it, it has to be designated a different religion. And what they came up with, as only sociologists could do, is the catchy term, uh, moralistic therapeutic deism. <laughs> now, there's no church of moralistic therapeutic deism showing up on any corner, but that's kind of the scary point, is that this is the stuff that's happening within the church. And so Smith said, this is not a religion of repentance from sin, of keeping the Sabbath, of living a servant as a servant of a sovereign divine, of steadfastly saying one's prayers, of faithfully observing high holy days, of building character through suffering, of basking in God's love and grace, of spending oneself in gratitude and love for the cause of social justice, etc. Rather, what appears to be the actual dominant religion among U.S. teenagers is centrally about feeling good, happy, secure, at peace. It's about attaining subjective well-being, being able to resolve problems and getting along amiably with other people. It's kind of touchy-feely nice. But it isn't the demands of Jesus. It's not let the dead bury their own dead. Uh, one of the uh, researchers on this project, Kenda Creasy Dean is her name, um, make some points that are that are important um, because before we get to feeling too bad about our youth and saying what are we going to do the problems with our youth how are we going to address this problem with the youth one of the side effects of this study was very enlightening and that is that the faith believed and professed by teenagers was a fairly significant barometer it effectively represented the faith practiced and preached by their parents and by extension their faith community. So in other words, the problem doesn't originate with the teens. The faith that's already over there is pretty much in sync with the faith that's being practiced and preached by their adults in their, in their communities. And Kenda Creasy Dean um, makes this point when she looks at how the church has been equipping its people, not just its teens. This is an inherited problem. Um, and she makes the point here, even if teenagers participate fully in youth ministry programs, are involved in churches, manage to dodge disruptive life events and overwhelming counter influences, youth are unlikely to take hold of a God who's too limp to take hold of them. Perhaps young people lack robust Christian identities because churches offer such a stripped-down version of Christianity that it no longer poses a viable alternative to imposter spiritualities like moralistic therapeutic deism. If teenagers lack an articulate faith, maybe it's because the faith we show them is too spineless to merit much in the way of conversation. Maybe teenagers' inability to talk about religion is not because the church inspires a faith too deep for words, but because the God story that we tell is too vapid to merit more than a superficial vocabulary. Ouch. Ouch. So there's work to be done in the harvest fields. There's work to be done in his harvest field. So what's that got to do with us? I'll leave us with, uh, with three questions. And as a member of this church, even though I go at night, it's not so I can sleep in in the morning. It's a convenient perk, though, I have to say. I get to see what the other guys do on Sundays if I'm not speaking somewhere else. Um, I'll include me here. This is our community. 
What does this have to do with us? So three questions that I'd like to leave us with. The first question is to ask each of us, ask ourselves, how prepared am I to work the harvest field? That's our privilege as a college. We get to prepare people for doing this type of work. But how, how prepared am I to work the harvest field? Does my life model Christ both within the church because the problem isn't that the enemy is just out there. Does my life model Christ within the church and outside of it? The second question to ask ourselves is how can I pray for and support other workers in the field? Am I giving of my prayers, of my time, of my financial resources? But are they my financial resources? Is it my time? Am I giving of these things to reclaim God's kingdom from enemy powers? And the third question is, am I listening for where the Lord might send me next? Do I acknowledge that I am entitled to no claim on myself? And here's a tough one, especially. I've got small kids. I have no claim on my children. I'll throw in here, do you know that the number one reason that overseas missions is declined and that students don't attend places like a Bible college anymore comes from parents blocking the way? Parents are okay with a short-term mission go over for a week or two with the youth group. But career missions, the number one reason that we don't have career missionaries anymore is because parents don't want that life for their children and they stand in the way. Christian parents, am I prepared to surrender my right to myself? Am I prepared to surrender my right to my children when God says go? wherever God might send. And so I, I leave that with us, and I'll say uh, a closing prayer here, and we'll conclude with, a, with some worship. So, Lord Jesus, we first of all repent. We repent, Lord Jesus, for not showing our children and for however many generations, for not representing you as you truly are, for softening you, for making you safe. We repent and we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would show yourself in power within our communities. We ask for Lawson, that this place might be a light on the hill, that we might truly be a place that allows your unfettered presence to draw in those in this community and beyond this community into the whole of this city and around the world. Make us obedient, make us faithful, we pray in Lord Jesus' name, amen.